Um, I'm now happy to wel welcome up our next speaker, uh, Wen Zhangxiao, from the uh, who is split uh, between uh, Stanford here at uh, here in Ron's group at the Genome Technology Center um, and uh, and Massachusetts General Hospital as well as Harvard Medical School. So he's in a lot of places, and we're happy that he's in this place right now. Yeah, it's always a always a problem to know where we, where is when. Um, <laughs> We call him Wen because I can pronounce that. Uh, and uh, I've known him for a very long time, and he has some really u unique capabilities. And one of them is he has, uh, he's an expert in physical chemistry, so he understands the details of how measurements are made, and also <clears throat> what are the problems in those measurements. And he also is an expert in statistics, so he can analyze the data. Um, and he's been uh, often asked to do a very large number of complex analysis. Uh, I know that the National Bureau of Standards, called NIST now, uses him a lot. And he's recently told me last night that uh, the FDA has given him a, a lot of their data uh, uh, to, to, to help him out. Uh, of course, they don't have any money to pay him, because uh, <laughs> it is the federal government. Um, but uh, uh, he's greatly underrated, uh, I think, and uh, he's very humble. And so it's, it's a light to continue to work with him over these years. So thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Ron. Um, um, first, I'd like to thank everybody who, uh, especially the patients and the caregivers, who made the expert to uh, come here. And it's an honor for me to stand in front of you and uh, share with you some of the results that uh, uh, we produced in the past year. So um, as Dr. Fluke uh, already mentioned, we in this room, we all know that uh, MECFS is a serious disease affecting multiple body systems. Dr. Fluke mentioned uh, the immune system, the metabolic system, and obviously the central nerve systems. So um, it has been known, I think, for a long time that it's likely the dysfunctions or dysregulations between all these systems. Um, let's just use this. For example, the um, the uh, so-called HPA um, axis, the immune cells, and uh, the gut microbiome, the, um, the muscle system of the patients that all to work together and uh, perhaps give rise to the symptoms that we see in the patients. Therefore, the first study that uh, was conducted by um, the Genome Technology Center under Ron's leadership and uh, supported by Open Medicine Foundation is this severely ill patient study um, where we selected a few patients who had uh, you know, severe illness and compared that with the normal controls. And the idea there is to carefully look over um, all the possible measurements that's available today from the genes to proteins to metabolites to the function of the cells, the gut microbiome, um, and uh, the functions of their organs and tissues, um, and environmental exposure, and their clinical records, and try to identify perhaps a core set of features that can then be followed in a bigger study. Um, and if these findings or subset of these findings will be verified, uh, they might lead to new discoveries and eventually uh, better treatments. So uh, a lot of people at Stanford, uh, as you can see there, um, as well as Open Medicine Institute and uh, UCSF participated in this study. So uh, because of the time, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to go through all the findings, uh, but in order to facilitate the collaboration you know, with the research community. Um, we set up this website, mecfs.stanford.edu, um, that has all the data and results that are generated to date. 
and uh, I think um, there are a few hundred uh, researchers that have uh, um, received access to this data set. And if anybody here um, or you know over the internet um, would like to look at this data, please contact us. It's just a registration process. So in terms of analysis, there are three pieces that were considered. One is, again, comparing patients with controls to see whether there is a consistent difference, which is shown in the middle. And on your left side, um, we can also compare results from different measurements on the same patient to see whether, for example, at gene level, there's a variant that could explain what you see um, in the metabolite level or you know, functions of uh, an immune cell for that particular person. So uh, that's basically cross-dimension um, analysis. And the third one, which is shown on your right side, because this is Silicon Valley, <laughs> there's you know, a large collection of uh, machine learning, statistical learning, artificial intelligence tools that, that one can use to try to integrate all this data together and try to identify a few features that might be able to best explain what we see um, in patients' uh, symptoms. Obviously, the last one is still preliminary because we, so far, only looked at uh, a few severely ill patients. So if those predictions can be verified in a larger study, um, then perhaps um, those can be used as either biomarkers or potential targets for therapy development. So um, as Dr. Fluke already mentioned, you know, SF36 is, the way, is one of the ways to measure um, the physical impairments of the patients. And if we look at uh, the um, score of these severely ill patients, which are on the um, upper left side, comparing to the controls, which are on the uh, lower right side. And there's uh, you know, a collection of different diseases where their SF36 was uh, recorded. Um, you can see that uh, patients and controls are clearly separate from each other. And um, uh, you know, also from other major diseases. Um, and it's clearly different uh, comparing to, for example, um, the scores of um, patients with depression. So we then uh, put the patients um, you know, uh, on Fitbit and try to measure their physical uh, impairments. This is just one measurement, which is the number of steps it takes for the patient versus the controls. And as expected, these patients are mostly homebound, and a lot of them are bad ridden. So um, the number of steps they take, obviously, is very, very different than a healthy person. Um, we also put those patients, um, as well as controls, um, under sleep monitoring. And as you can see here, uh, for example, RAM latency, uh, stage 3 uh, eight, uh, latency between patients and the controls. And uh, the patients are in orange and the controls are in blue. You can see that uh, typically it, it took much longer time for the patients to get uh, into deep sleep, for example. And that might explain some of the uh, you know, problems that the patient feel. Um, so in terms of molecular mechanisms, uh, the first thing we'll look at was um, the, the infectious agents and the exposure in these patients, because that's the obvious place to look. Um, and so I think Pei Dong, who's in the, in the uh, audience, uh, he developed tools to sequence uh, specifically uh, 20 common viruses um, in human. And we applied his tool to studying patients and the controls. And as you can see here, um, that's the number of positives and, uh, uh, in patients and in the controls. For example, for EBV, there's one out of 20 patients that were tested positive and the same number of controls that were tested positive. So the bottom line is that we didn't see any significant enrichment in any of those 20 common viruses. The second thing we did was, in collaboration with UCSF, um, 
we try to isolate the viral particles from blood and then conduct DNA sequencing. So that's a more uh, shotgun approach. And uh, the most significant signal is what you can see in the down um, lower right corner. Um, that's the uh, analovirus. We know that analovirus is uh, perhaps the most dominant uh, virus species um, in the human. And you can see that for most of the patients and controls, uh, you do see that virus. Uh, but we don't see a, a, a increase in load of this virus or any other virus um, that we uh, studied. And we also did um, uh, antibody antigen tests of a few uh, viruses as shown there, and none of them were significantly different between patients and controls. Um, in terms of bacterial infections, Lyme, uh, Bart uh, Bartonella, and uh, uh, Mycoplasma um, were tested, and uh, again, we didn't see a difference between patients and controls. In addition, uh, heavy metals in urine uh, were measured, and uh, we couldn't see a difference either. So it seems like uh, uh, perhaps it's the human response to uh, external stress that uh, might contribute more to this disease, um, you know, at least from this particular data. Um, we then looked at the clinical tests. There were about 200 some clinical tests um, conducted for each patient and control. Uh, this is probably one of the most uh, different uh, uh, result between patients and controls, and that's the morning uh, cortisol level. We know that in, in normal people, you would have a high cortisol level uh, in the morning, and that gradually goes down over the day, um, which is what you see in the blue line here, which are the, uh, which are the controls um, for this study. But you see a uh, much flatter response in the patients. Um, we next look at the cytokines. Since these are severe ill patients, so um, perhaps as expected, their cytokine response is much stronger comparing to some of the uh, other published studies where um, there's, their patients are not really limited to severe patients. So shown here are four uh, cytokines that showed uh, the biggest difference, the GMCF-CF leptin and the CXCL5 or uh, ENA78, uh, these were reported in multiple publications before. And uh, again, the difference here is just uh, the, the, the magnitude of change in severe patients compared to controls uh, is bigger than what uh, was seen before. Uh, one of the new findings that, uh, as far as I know, hasn't been reported is this uh, BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And it's uh, very extensively studied in a number of neurological diseases such as Parkinson, Alzheimer, uh, etc. And it's a, a well-known marker for neurological diseases. As you can see there, uh, the patient level is about threefold less than the controls. Um, we know that BDNF is involved in the growth, the differentiation, and the maintenance of nerve cells. So uh, this might indicate that there is a neurological component uh, that we should look into. Uh, we actually also compared data from uh, uh, NASA and other space agencies where they tie people in bed for you know, a few days to a month and measure you know, different uh, parameters in those you know, normal people. And uh, we did not see a decrease of this molecule uh, in those studies, so this apparently is potentially unique to our study. In terms of the metabolites in the plasma of the patients compared to the controls, uh, these are the three um, metabolites that showed the biggest difference between patients and controls. Uh, Indopropionate, uh, which is also called IPA, um, is also a known neuroprotective factor. Um, and uh, as you can see on the left side, the patient level is uh, much lower than the controls. Um, lysine and uh, hydroproline uh, uh, were higher in patients compared to the controls. Uh, Dr. Farouk uh, talked about some of the amino acid uh, dysfunctions in patients, so um, we're 
trying to look into uh, this further. For example, hydroproline obviously is related to proline, which is um, a major component of uh, collagen, for example. So uh, because of time, I also t uh, only talk about the indopropionate because it's known that uh, it's made in the gut by the gut microbiome. Um, so it's made by specific microbes in the gut from tryptophan to indopropionate, and that goes through the gut barrier and get to the brain and it's neuroprotective. So in our patients of severely ill, um, the level of this particular molecule is much lower um, comparing to the controls. So that leads to us to look into the gut microbiome between patients and controls. So each um, you know, orange or red dot there shows one patient, and the blue dot there again shows the controls. So you can see that uh, the, um, you know, the general pattern of the microbiome in patients is much more diverse than the controls, which is more gathered together. So if we look at the sp uh, specific species between the patients versus controls, um, I think the biggest difference, as you probably can see here um, in, in orange, are those significantly increased uh, verrucal microbia um, in a subset of patients, and these patients are mostly male, uh, comparing to any of those controls. We're still trying to figure out uh, the biological, potential biological implication of this and why it only occurred in, in male patients. So we then did um, whole genome sequencing uh, of these patients just to see whether there's a genetic component that might contribute to the symptoms in these patients. And this is just a very brief list of what we found uh, that might be worthwhile in a bigger uh, study to perhaps you know, try to verify these findings. So the top one in the list is killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptors. Um, and as it's well known that uh, the NK cell functions in patients uh, probably is different than the controls. And uh, um, it's uh, interesting to see that uh, a large number of uh, NK cell uh, immunoglobulin-like receptors are different in patients comparing to the general population in the U.S. Um, Neuronexin is, is one of another um, genes um, that's studied in a number of neurological diseases, OCD, uh, you know, et cetera. And, and that's another one that we're trying to follow up. Uh, the next two, uh, Dynam and uh, FAM20C, which is Golgi-associated uh, secretory pathway kinase, um, these two are known to be pathogenic or, or likely pathogenic. So that's why we were trying to verify this in a bigger study. The last one, um, there's not much known about that gene, but there's a number of variants um, that look suspicious. So the parted, um, it's a membrane-associated uh, protein, and um, uh, we're, we're trying to do targeted studies on that one as well. Um, since there, is, there was uh, some suggestion of calcium channels involvement in this disease, so we actually look at uh, those specific genes that were reported before, and unfortunately we couldn't see significance um, in that gene and, and associated genes. So um, this is just a reminder, um, you know, just a sort of brief discussion of uh, the, the, the killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptors are important because they're on the surface of NK cells and they work with the HLA genes um, to either activate or inhibit the NK cells. And um, um, the red boxes there show those genes that are different between patients and controls. And uh, we're in collaboration with, of, uh, with the Stanford uh, Blood Center to uh, do targeted sequencing of um, um, this group of genes together with the HLA genes and try to see whether we can learn more about these genes. 
Um, and I just said uh, in the beginning, you know, since this is, a, since this is a, a, you know, Silicon Valley, so you know, if you do uh, a bunch of um, you know, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, you would uh, try to, we would be able to identify a set of variants that uh, would best explain uh, patient uh, um, symptoms. And um, you know, again, this is preliminary. So because of time, I'll just show you uh, a blow-up version of part of this. So you can see CFS is in the middle, and uh, the SF36 parameters. Uh, Konofsky score is another measurement of uh, physical function of the patients, and uh, they, you know, they are expected to be strongly linked to the disease because they're used. Um, and you see BDNF, uh, the indoproperinate, that are most connected to different aspects of SF36. And um, you know, tryptophan is down here. Um, that's another molecule I think uh, Dr. Fire will talk about. Um, and, and the lysine and the hydro, uh, hydro lysine over here. So again, this is only based on the severely ill patients and it's preliminary. Um, we're trying to in, incorporate other studies into this network, and I hope uh, perhaps in the future I would be able to update you um, a you know, more concrete result in terms of what we know. So um, with that, uh, I'll just uh, talk about the next steps. On the immune system side, um, we're doing sequencing of uh, CARE and HLA, uh, which are the ones that uh, um, you know, are significant from our study, and uh, continue identification of the um, pathogen-associated molecules, basically the um, RNA viruses, for example, um, and see whether you know, that's potentially different between patients and controls, and the damage-associated molecules, which are the host response between patients and controls. On the metabolism side, uh, we're doing a uh, muscle biopsy study um, of patients after uh, exercise um, at Boston, and uh, Dr. Tompkins will talk more about that, I think, uh, later today. And together with molecular imaging, looking into the central nervous system um, of these patients. I know a number of uh, speakers today will actually talk about more about either the metabolism side um, and the central nervous system side. And um, I think working together with uh, all the people in this room and over the internet, um, hopefully we can learn the big picture um, of this disease and perhaps can identify a potential cure uh, of this disease. And uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention.